hello everyone. Welcome, uh, welcome back to our Foundations uh, Tuapapa webinar. Thanks so much for joining us again tonight. Uh, we've had fantastic feedback from last week, so thank you very much to those of you who uh, have taken the time to uh, feed back to us both uh, the things that you've enjoyed and uh, some suggestions about how we can improve the engagement. Uh, tonight it's uh, a great uh, privilege to be able to welcome Chris Clark, who's a great friend of this diocese. Uh, as I said last week, Chris is uh, uh, formerly um, a CEO in the health sector, uh, a, a CEO of World Vision, and now uh, works in consultancy, particularly with uh, not-for-profit organisations, uh, but a, um, a member of St George's Epsom uh, Parish in Auckland, and uh, understands us from the inside out, and someone who brings considerable expertise at understanding the way in which uh, churches uh, need to uh, change, and uh, how we can support each other through through change, and how we can understand that in the context of our culture. So that's the focus for this evening, uh, and I'm really thrilled uh, to welcome Chris, and I'm going to hand now to Stephen, who's going to help us uh, to begin with prayer and any particular instructions about how we manage um, this, uh, this webinar. So welcome to each and every one of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, delighted that you made it through the Auckland traffic to join us this evening. That's terrific and for your welcome. Just want to touch on a few things before we uh, commence with prayer and a, and a reflection. Many of you have used Zoom before, I know, but tonight I just wanted to touch on a few features that you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen. So for those of you who are managing the setup tonight, if you roll your mouse over the bottom of your screen, it should click up with the three options that you can see here in the screenshot. Each of those may be useful this evening. That first Q&A is where you've got a specific question that you want to write to the presenter to have answered. The chat button in the middle is for any general comment or golden reflection, any pearl of wisdom that you want to throw out for people's benefit, which will be recorded as well. Just be sure that when you do make that chat comment that you set it to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can benefit from what God is doing. The last part is that if we go into a plenary session and you want to ask a question, then you just need to raise your hand. You'll know whether you've raised your hand or not raised your hand by whether it turns green. When it turns green, you'll be invited to unmute your microphone and then you can put your question uh, to Chris this evening and he will proceed with answering. Hopefully that's really clear. Hopefully between all of you, um, you've got all of those options and we get the opportunity to use them tonight. But if you do have any technical issues, do either contact me through the chat box or contact me later during the week and we can work together to solve any challenges you might have. There is an old tradition in the church called Lectio Divina. Many of you know it and use it. And it's a tradition that invites us to wrestle with scripture like Jacob did with God. So over these four weeks, I want to return to these verses from 1 Corinthians, the heart of which is Jesus Christ, our one foundation. Now, St. Paul introduces this concept by reminding us that any work we do is built upon someone else's foundation, the master builders who came before us, for whom we give thanks. Fundamental to our identity as Anglicans is the heritage claim that our spiritual authority can be traced all the way back to the apostles. For more than 2,000 years, we have passed the mantle of responsibility on from generation to generation. Now, this means that we not only owe a great debt to all those from whom we have inherited, but we're also part of an epic story of change. And as New Zealanders, we've been a major player in that change space. We've confronted issues of divorce, the ordination of women, 
and children's admission to communion, among many other serious theological issues. We have always paid a price for this. Change is costly. And therefore, as St. Paul might say, we need to choose with care how to build. And that's precisely why we have invited the amazing Chris Clark to talk us through his experience of change. First, let's read this through and pause, and then I'll introduce Chris and pray for him as well. We are God's servants working together. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building on it. Each builder must choose with care how to build on it. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, the work of each builder will become visible, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each has done. If what has been built on the foundation survives, the builder will receive a reward. If the work is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. The builder will be saved, but only as through fire. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Now, I know that every one of you has read that short bio that I hijacked from the internet and sent through about Chris. Uh, so I, I know you're already aware of his national and his international roles, but I want you to know also that he's a deeply committed Christian with a real heart for students and for young people. And when he's not teaching, praying, mentoring, and leading others, he's also a very keen gardener and reno man with more than a few projects. Uh, he had a very busy lockdown period, let me tell you. I'm absolutely delighted that we're able to welcome him this evening. And I would like uh, to pray for you, Chris, before handing over the uh, camera and the mic to you as well. So let's pause. Loving God, we give you thanks for your gifted servant, Chris, for all that you have asked him to do, for the many challenges that you have set before him that he has all too willingly taken up, for the many challenges before him that he has struggled to take up, but which has formed him and taught him that we might learn from his wisdom and his experience. Lord God, be with him and guide him tonight as you have throughout his life, that we might profit from his experience and so be better servants in your kingdom and see your work done. Amen. Well, a very good evening, everybody. Kia ora tato. Yeah, my name is Chris, and I'll just check with Stephen if you can actually hear me. Though I must say, those of you who can see that photograph, that photograph was taken in Iraq, just on the uh, border with Syria during, um, well, the long running war. And a remarkable bunch of children growing up in the most extraordinary situation. It's just a delight to see it. I haven't seen that for a while. Well, once again, folks, it's a real pleasure to uh, join you this evening. Um, the introduction is always uh, raises expectations much higher than the delivery. I think the reason that I'm a consultant, frankly, is because uh, when I was running organizations, be it in the health sector or the humanitarian world, I pretty well made every mistake you can make when it comes to uh, managing change, which is why I don't think anyone would ever entrust me with an organization again. And what I want to do tonight actually is talk through change and how complex and how difficult change is. But what are some of the lessons that I've learned in terms of managing change, just both at a personal level, but particularly in terms of in a, in a church context. So on that note, how it's going to work is that Stephen is going to control the video. And if I go too slow, he'll just quickly speed up the slides and that will be the prompt to me to go faster. Uh, we'll have a couple of sort of pauses in the uh, conversation, but allow most of the chat to happen towards the end. So, Stephen, shall we go to the first slide? Yeah, seriously, uh, you want us to change? The theory of change is absolutely wonderful, unless we're actually asked to apply it to ourselves. And 
For those of you who might have been fans of Susan Howitch, uh, who wrote the wonderful Starbridge series about the Church of England, uh, she was followed by a woman called Catherine Fox, uh, who married a church minister who has actually in the last few years moved through to be a dean and now is a bishop in the Anglican Church. I think he's somewhat embarrassed by some of the books that his wife has written because of a very really candid account of life in the Anglican Church. But this next slide is an excerpt from um, one of her books called Acts and Emissions. And uh, it's a really delightful story about the challenge of change in the Anglican Church. So let me read it to you as we go to how many Anglicans does it take to change a light bulb? Well, uh, if only it were that simple. What sort of bulb are you talking about? Furthermore, we need to discuss the whole concept of bulbhood. Is it timeless or can it be contextualized? Who decides and on what basis? After decades of anguished debate, the Church of England is more or less okay with screw-in as well as bayonet fittings for table lamps, that is. When it comes to overhead lights, a bayonet remains less controversial, but so long as it's shining, most good-hearted folk won't insist on scrutinizing the packet it came in. In theory, we can even screw in bulbs on chandeliers, provided the screw in bulbs aren't ever actually screwed in. You're asking me how many Anakins does it take to change a light bulb? Well, thousands, actually hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands, millions maybe. And how long does it take? God only knows. In the meantime, it's night. And from the outside, it seems to all the world as though the church is dark and closed. It's uh, at one level a very funny um, uh, uh, tease, but at another level it speaks uh, to the heart of the issue that while we debate the change, the outside world looks us and thinks we're just simply dark and closed. So let me take you to a biblical story, which I'm going to use as a metaphor for the rest of this evening. Uh, first of all, a picture. This is a picture of a somewhat startled Joshua. Uh, he's leading the people uh, of Israel across the River Jordan. And this is no mean feat. He's taken over from Moses, who was the super prophet, and now he's been given the job. And one of his first jobs is to lead two million people uh, across a flooded river, namely the Jordan. He couldn't have picked a more inauspicious time because the Jordan River is absolutely in flood. And the reason I've actually picked this image is because, as I say, there's about two million people there. It's based on the fact that the Bible talks about 660,000, but typically that refers to men and excludes children and women. So we can imagine that this is a very sizable population. What do we know about that group? Well, the next slide tells us that there were probably four different groups of people camped on the east side of the River Jordan, watching this river in flood, as, um, as Joshua is saying, it's time to cross. That first group, and some of you may recognize this in your own faith communities, the ones who want to go back to Egypt. In other words, um, although second generation, their parents have died out, they look back and they think, you know, the stories mum and dad told us about Egypt, it really wasn't that bad. Sure, they were busy building, making bricks all the time, but at least they had one decent meal a day. So the nostalgics who uh, romanticize the past. Then there's the pragmatists, those who are really happy to stay on the eastern side of the River Jordan. Now these are the pragmatists. So it goes like this, look, the eastern bank is better than Egypt, at least we're free and look, some of our animals can graze here and it's actually quite pleasant. Might not be the promised land, but it's a lot better than what we've seen. We'll stay here. And in fact, we actually know in the story that two tribes in fact cross back over from the promised land to live uh, on the eastern bank. Then the group that I suspect we are most familiar with, those who are waiting for the right conditions. You see, what we know is that the river was in flood. And uh, one thing we also know is you never attempt to cross a flooded river in any circumstances. So they almost had right on their side. Look, we'll just wait for the right conditions when, when the river drops down to a more normal level and then we'll cross. And in the fourth group, oh, we're willing to go now. In fact, this group, the adventurers, have probably crossed over the river already a couple of times, not told anybody. They're the adventurers. And I think when we look at our own faith communities, when we look at our own families, but certainly we look at our own uh, communities, what we see is people group themselves into largely those four communities, which begs a question. And that's the next slide. And that question is, in which camp or camps is your own faith community? And then in which camp are you? And often we see there's a real dissonance between where you might be standing as a leader in your community and where your own faith community is standing. And then in which camp or camps do you think the diocese is? And as a consequence of that, how are you actually managing the dis dissonance, if there is any, between where you stand, where the diocese stands, and where your faith community stands? 
Now, why this matters is for the simple reason that change is coming whether we like it or not. The next slide is an excerpt taken from the um, Faith and Belief uh, in New Zealand study that was uh, commissioned in May 2018. So it's just, just two years old. It's a very detailed slide uh, and, and there's a handout which you can all have so, so you can look at this in more detail later on. What it tells us is that New Zealand basically divides itself into thirds. A third identify as Christian, a third identify as spiritual but not religious, and another third identify as no religious or spiritual beliefs at all. So a third, a third, a third, and then within the third, in terms of active practicing churchgoers, about 9% of the population would be extremely involved in church, going probably at least a couple of times a month. So still a very sizable group within a population of 5 million, but nonetheless a minority. And these numbers are artificially high because if we look at it at a generational point of view, what we see is the older generations are holding up church attendance. And let's be honest, that reflects many of our own parishes where uh, it's largely older people who are supporting the church and many younger people are largely absent. To get a sense of what this looks like historically, the next slide is essentially a, an assessment of, against the New Zealand population, of Anglicans between 1848 and 2013. As you can see, the direction of travel is only downwards. So change is coming uh, ready or not. And the story that you've probably already heard is the really sad story of Kodak. And I think it's got some parallels for us. So let me tell you the story before we get into uh, some of the detail for ourselves tonight. So Kodak was an extraordinary organization. They invented uh, the, f uh, the film and they grew to be a huge enterprise at its height around $10.6 billion. And uh, they produced some of the finest film that you will ever see. And yet now they are in statutory receivership. They were actually um, reformed just a few years ago, but just, just a, 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 a tiny fraction of what they once were. Now the story of Kodak is challenging, I think, for us because in many ways, it shares some parallels with us in the sense that Kodak invented film in the same kind of way, to put it bluntly, that um, the Anglican Church invented faith in New Zealand. We were, through CMS and others, uh, among the first to bring uh, the Christian faith to, to, to New Zealand. And so we were there from the founding. Uh, we were the dominant player for many years, so we had um, status and uh, we were uh, achieving very high numbers of attendance relative to other denominations. But even strong denominations, strong organizations can, uh, can fail. And so I wanna personalize that and take that from the conceptual to the practical and tell you a story about my camera. So I am a really keen photographer and this is my first camera. It cost me an absolute fortune, let me tell you. Um, as a student, I bought it and I was very careful of it. I took it around the world. I had some wonderful times with it. It's a, film camera. But here's the challenge. Um, along came digital. And I was initially curious about digital. I thought well, digital sounds like a, a, a great idea, but I wasn't going to make the change because I'd loved my camera and I'd spent a lot of money on my camera. So I invested a lot in that camera and it meant a lot to me. Some of my best memories of photography were through that camera. So I initially resisted the idea of moving from a film camera to a digital camera. And I, just, I staunchly defended taking uh, film as opposed to digital images with all my friends, that the best photographers were still taking film camera rather than digital. And I used to appeal to uh, people that I actually knew and respected because I noticed that most of them still were taking a film. But here's the thing. My appetite had actually been whetted. Actually, I quite liked the concept rather than taking a photograph and waiting for six weeks to find out whether it actually worked, I could actually look at that photograph on the back of my camera and if I didn't like it, I could take another one. And it was also pretty much free once I'd actually bought the camera. So that kind of had whetted my appetite, but it actually took some pain. It took some pain before I was willing to abandon my lovely old film camera and actually buy the first of my digital cameras. And what was that pain? Well, the pain was this, that actually my film camera broke down it no longer worked as well as it once did. And so it was in the face of pain that I went and bought my first digital camera. But I didn't quite give up, and this might be familiar to some of you who've taken photographs. I decided I'd still keep my old camera, even though it was slightly broken, for my best photographs. So I'd still bring it out when I really wanted to take serious photography and just use the digital for normal stuff around home. Well, here's the interesting thing. The moment I took my first digital photograph, I never ever went back to my film camera and it still sits at the top of my wardrobe, no doubt gathering dust. Now, why do I tell you that story? 
I tell you that story because I think in many ways, um, my personal experience of change is how organizations experience change. So let's go to that slide, which is called Your Experiences of Change. And I want to ask you a question. It's a couple more slides along, I think, Stephen. Um, is what has been your experience of change? Um, what was it? How did it go? What did you learn from it? And what would you do differently? Because all of us have experienced change. And this really matters because we are going to try and lead others through change. So what was a positive experience from that? What was a negative experience from that? And to what extent was my battle with going from film to digital actually a battle that all of us face when we're thinking about change? So on that note, I'm gonna take a pause. I want you to ask yourself a question. And I gather we're in all sorts of different groupings. Some are meeting as vestries, some are meeting by yourselves, some are meeting over dinner and so on. But here's the question to take a, a three or four minutes to think on. What change have you got coming up? What change have you got coming up? Reflect on that question, and then what we're gonna do is pick up on that question in two or three minutes time, and actually go through and start to think through how do we actually make change happen in our communities? And then folks, um, hopefully you can hear me, and hopefully you've had a little bit of a moment, uh, if nothing else, to get a, a toilet break, but uh, hopefully you've also had a chance to think through that question of, um, uh, what change have you got coming up in, in your own life, in, in your own faith community? Because here's the thing, even though we can think through the change that's coming up, uh, in many respects, even seeing the oncoming train heading towards us down the tracks doesn't make avoiding it any easier. In other words, change is often associated with pain, both at a personal level and also at a professional level. And for any of us who are involved in uh, leading change, sometimes it can feel like uh, you've been given a particularly bad birthmark vulnerable birthmark hell, in the sense that you're the one who's going to have to lead this change. So on that thought, we have actually, uh, in our midst, a superb change leader, and that is actually in our Prime Minister. And I say this not as a political comment, but actually picking up on the international media who have rated uh, Jacinda Ardern's leadership of the COVID crisis here in New Zealand as, as an exemplar for the rest of the world. And there's been a lot written on what Jacinda did right. Uh, here's an article from uh, the Independent uh, newspaper just a few weeks ago, and it commented on uh, Jacinda's leadership and why it was so right. It made a number of comments. First of all, that uh, she showed genuine empathy. Now, there's a distinction between empathy and sympathy, uh, and that's a very important um, uh, distinction. Secondly, she showed real strength. And I have to say, uh, as a New Zealander who, like all of us, was initially quite concerned about COVID and what it would mean, I, I needed to know that our Prime Minister was in control. I, didn't, I did not want to hear that she wasn't in control. In that sense, when she was once asked the question about, so Prime Minister, you know, are you concerned? Her response was a brilliant answer as a leader. Uh, I am sure she's concerned, but her answer was, I have a plan. So what we see is a leader who has empathy, a leader who's in control, but also a leader who quite publicly took advice. So the ego was well managed and referenced science, obviously referenced the Ministry of Health and others as part of that conversation. What we saw over all those weeks was a consistency in messaging and a consistency in approach. Further, uh, in her messaging, what she was doing uh, was focusing very much on the human consequences of the COVID crisis rather than the many other consequences, which obviously included the economic consequences and very present. While politically it might have served her purposes to be on, on the news every day at 1 p.m., it also showed a sense that she was very active in our lives. She led, she devised and executed a strategy, and above all, she told the story about the strategy. The great care, and clearly lots of people were involved in advising on this, in terms of concepts of the bubble, in terms of the concepts of the four levels, all those kind of things. And then the constant messaging around being kind and the team of five million, irrespective of your political views. And this is not a political comment. This is just a comment on quite an exceptional period of leadership, such that even people on the other side of the political divide will at least acknowledge the leadership that was shown in terms of the health aspects of the crisis. So when we look at Jacinda Ardern, what we can see is some remarkable qualities of change leadership. I'm gonna pick up on this because in practice, most change is not successful like New Zealand's response to COVID thus far at least. Most change fails. And the reason that most change fails is actually not because it was a bad idea. It fails because first of all, there's a lack of resolve on the part of the change leader. 
I have felt this so often. When I was working in healthcare in Hawke's Bay and I was the CEO there and knew that the decisions I was taking was going to have a real impact on families and on staff and I was faced sometimes with forced choices, is that where I took a decision and stood behind that decision, it was far more likely to be successful than where I started to equivocate. Secondly, change fails because of poor execution. Again, a great idea, but poorly executed. Part of that poor execution often comes when we fail to think about the unintended consequences. So let me give you an example from um, the South Island, from where I came from. In the Melbourne Sounds, uh, there's lots of, uh, or used to be, lots of cod, but it got fished out by a local fisher people. So what was decided is that we'd put a ban on catching cod, and we all agreed to this. And so if you caught a cod, it was under a certain size, you threw it back. And we all got very good at doing that because we realized it would help the fishery. The unintended consequence of this remarkably good idea was, however, that we got a sudden burst in the numbers of shags in the Melbourne Sounds. Why? Because they suddenly realized that there was a free meal every time you went fishing because you'd throw back your eight inch cod or your 12 inch cod and all they had to do was be ready and dive down and catch it. So what happened was cod numbers increased marginally, but shag numbers increased exponentially. That's a great example of an unintended consequence. And when we're thinking through change, thinking through those consequences that are intended, but particularly the ones that are not intended. Uh, and that leads to the next point, that so often when we think about change, we're thinking about the next step. In other words, we're playing drafts rather than thinking three, four, five, six steps ahead. And to lead change well, we need to be thinking through the consequences of the consequences of the consequences. And the last one, and I'm sure we've all seen this, I've done it, and I've also been the recipient of this, where people are advocating change, essentially overstate the benefits and underestimate the time that's involved. All of this to say that if we're going to lead change, in other words, if we've got that birthmark on our chest, we need one word in particular, best summed up by Nelson Mandela. We need the word courage. And what is courage? As Mandela says, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who, who does not feel afraid, or these days we'd say the brave woman is not she who does not feel afraid, but he or she who conquers that fear. So in fact, as change leaders, uh, if we don't feel a sense of fear, maybe we've underestimated the scale of change that we're supposed to be leading. The point is not the absence of fear, but rather that we triumph over it uh, and can conquer that fear. So with those thoughts in mind, we're now gonna peel an onion. We've done the big picture. We're now gonna go to a slightly smaller picture. And in fact, we're gonna go on a journey. <sighs> we're gonna pack the car and go on a family holiday. And those of you who've done that will know just how fraught that is. We used to pack our Mazda 323 with two toddlers in the back, a very small car with our luggage, and we head from the South Island, bottom of the South Island, from Dedeen, all the way up to Golden Bay. And let me tell you, the journey was not a joy. But one thing we learned in terms of packing a car is that the long way is so often the short way. So when we think about change, uh, what we need to think about as we pack the car is first of all convince ourselves as we go on this journey of change, that the change is actually necessary. It sounds such an obvious point, but it is worth pausing before you implement change just to ask yourself the question, you know, is this a response to my irritation? Is this a response to my tiredness? Or genuinely, has this something to do with the mission of our faith community? Then secondly, to ask a question, whose decision is it anyway? One of the things I notice increasingly is that leaders who are feeling indecisive crowdsource their decisions. Rather than taking a decision themselves, they will actually ask others uh, seemingly to consult, but actually it's because they lack the courage to do it themselves about um, a particular decision. If you've decided it actually is your decision, then there's another critical question. And but there's many things we're gonna to touch on tonight, but this point I'd love you to retain, which is when you're thinking about change and when you're talking to people about change, be really clear whether you're telling people, whether you're selling the concept, whether you're consulting on the concept or whether in a very real sense you're co-creating the concept. When I think of the mistakes I made both at World Vision and, and as a CEO at Hawke's Bay, it is where I thought I was selling an idea to the staff. They thought I was generally looking to co-create the idea with them. So being really clear about are you just basically telling people this is what we're going to do, whether you're promoting an idea, this is something I passionately believe in, I'm really hoping you'll get on board with this, whether you're consulting an idea and say, look, I've got this, this lovely idea, but I'd love you to work with me to make it better. Or whether you're genuinely coming to people and saying, hey, look, want to think about, I don't know, say urban ministry in Hamilton, 
I haven't got any ideas myself, but let's work on this together. Getting that sense of framing right from the start will avoid all sorts of problems down the track. Is the time right? Now, of course, we've seen this in a very real way with COVID. COVID has actually just interrupted so much stuff. And uh, pushing ahead with some stuff may not be smart in the current COVID environment. Equally, there may be some stuff which would not have been appropriate to do previously, which now must just be done. So it's understanding the kairos, the season of time, versus the chronos, which is the particular time period. Let me rattle on through. It's about identifying who your key stakeholders are. Think about your stakeholders both in terms of the power they exert and the influence they exert. I learned very quickly at World Vision that, and actually at Hawke's Bay that it's serendipitous indeed if your leadership team uh, represented on your leadership chart are the actual leaders in an organisation. Those of you who understand hospitals well and those of you who understand church well will know that often the power sits outside the formal constitutional and legal structure. You need to understand that. It may well be that the organist is actually the most powerful person in your church community. It is worth researching the change history. If we're talking here, say, about a particular parish, what has happened before? What change worked? What change didn't work? What will people be fearful of? As you see, we haven't even started the change yet. We're doing the packing the car stage. You need to build a team around you. Leading change is really tough and uh, can be a very lonely task at times. And having a team around you that you know has your back and you have that back is a wonderful source. And actually also a team that can laugh and actually help you not take yourself too seriously. You've got to accept if you're going to lead change, that you're going to have to accept a higher level of risk than normal. Some people will not like this. And so if you see this as a popularity uh, experience, uh, this is probably not the job for you. And at the same time, think through what are the things that are going to block change happening? It might be simple stuff. We simply don't have the money. It might be that you don't simply have enough people. Or it might be that actually tradition, rather than working for you, is working against you. Where that takes me to is the last point, is that leading change is inherently messy. You will definitely not get everything right, except that now before you launch into change, because there's no point down the track beating yourself up saying, oh, only I had seen that coming. So accept it's going to be messy, accept there's going to be some false starts, accept that it won't be perfectly elegant, but get on and do it anyway. So we packed the car. Let's talk about the road trip. This slide um, almost reads for itself, but it's the classic framing around how do you lead change. And it starts with establishing the case for change. In other words, they often talk about the burning platform. In other words, you need to convince people why do they need to change and why do they need to change now? The next point is cannot be overemphasized. Communicate, 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 communicate. You may think you've spoken to absolutely everybody about the issue and that everybody's on board. I guarantee you they're not. And it's far better that you keep communicating and over communicating than under communicating. Guarantee there'll be two or three people who missed that meeting, missed two meetings in a row, were overseas, pre-COVID, whatever it was, that uh, meant they actually missed the message or they've got the wrong end of the stick. And so communicating, communicating, communicating. And again, going back to Jacinda Ardern, if you look carefully at what she was doing, that was a classic piece of communicate, 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 and never stop communicating. And she knew she was starting to get breakthrough when you could actually hear in the discourse uh, in, in wider society, her language being repeated. Languages around bubbles, languages around levels, languages about kindness, languages about the team of five million and so on. Find those small wins and celebrate them. Now, this is obvious stuff, but often we neglect this. Um, where it's working, celebrate it. Um, be alert, though, as the change is going on, that, that the power balance within your community is changing. It means you can't get distracted by the noise. You won't take everybody with you on this journey. Unfortunately, Joshua had the task of getting two million people across the river, um, and he got all of them across. Most of us won't get most people across, well, we won't get everybody across the river. We should get most people across the river. But some of the noisiest people you will deal with are those who are going to refuse to cross. And the reality is they will never cross. And it becomes their choice whether they cross with us. But the trouble is, if we see this as some kind of consensus, we will probably never cross that river. Now, I found really helpful in leading change is the power of metaphor. So, for example, the metaphor that we're using around uh, Joshua crossing the River Jordan to the Promised Land is a really rich metaphor because it helps find a language to describe the sort of change that, that you're talking about. 
The next point is a very important ethical point. Ensure that you honor those who are being left behind. In other words, those who are choosing not to go on the journey. It is not their fault. They have done nothing wrong that they're not going on the journey. That is their choice. And it's so critical that you honor them and respect them. Think about your key team right through this change. They'll be taking hits along with you. And of course, at the same time, they've got family, they've got parents, they've got job, they've got health issues and so on. So this is not the only thing in their life. Resist the temptation to overshare. Keep your circle of trust really small, which leads to my next point, is that as a leader leading change, however big or small the change is, you're on a stage, you are performing, you are convincing, you are cajoling, you're encouraging, doing all those kind of things. Every actor who's on a stage needs a backstage. That's the um, props, it's the lighting, it's the costumes needed to support the performance. So don't neglect your own backstage. Now that might be your family, it could well be your prayer time, it could well be your time in study, it could well be your time in church. The point is that if you don't have a backstage, the front stage performance will definitely, definitely fail. And lastly, um, manage yourself. Uh, don't underestimate the personal toll. I was leading a major piece of change uh, in Hawke's Bay. And um, at <laughs> one stage, my wife and I were saying, you know, when was the last time we actually laughed together? And when was kind of the last time we had fun together? And we realized that we got so caught up in this piece of change that we'd stop actually doing the thing that we love doing with each other, which was having some fun. And so we had to learn to lighten the load. In other words, not do so much because actually we're focused on change. And secondly, to lighten up. In other words, make sure we were deliberately practicing having some fun together. To be honest, at times we didn't feel like doing that, but it was so important. So as part of leading change, also manage yourself. Now, let's go to the next slide. You are all familiar with this if you've ever been on a road trip with toddlers. We would leave from Dunedin, and by the time we get to Omaru, now for those of you who don't spend much time in the South Island, Omaru is about two hours from Dunedin, and our kids would be saying, are we there yet? And we'd be thinking, oh no, we have got another 12 hours of driving in this Mazda. We've got another 12 hours of listening to the wiggles or bananas and pajamas. We've got another 12 hours of road sickness and car sickness and toilet stops and playground stops and McDonald's stops before we even get to the destination. That sense of, are we there yet? Which will prevail against every piece of change because people don't appreciate that change takes time. So that leads us to this conclusion, and I hope you're not feeling um, put off by the thought of leading change. It is that change is not for the faint hearted. For the very reason that I struggle to change from film to digital, in trying to lead change at a, a more macro scale with your own faith community or organization or even your own family, um, it's not for the faint hearted. What does that mean? It means, first of all, I think confronting the brutal facts and actually confronting some sacred cows. Every organization has its sacred cows that can take all sorts of form. And most of us aren't aware of them because it's just part of the furniture. I'm not trying to confuse metaphors here, but you know what I mean. And actually it's about facing the brutal facts, particularly in terms of what happens if we don't change. And as a faith community in New Zealand, we must look at statistics that are coming out of the faith and belief study. We must look at the declining numbers of Anglicans and face the brutal facts that it is not axiomatic that we'll be around in 50 years or 100 years times. So in fact, that the Lord is tasking us through his spirit with actually confronting those, those facts and doing something about it. But in leading change, and many of you will understand this next point, that what happens is the tension doesn't go away. Actually, what happens is it tends to heighten pre-existing internal tensions. That in leading change, there's actually initially a loss of momentum, which is ironic because the, momentum, the, the idea is that change will go faster. But actually, through the change process, you lose a lot of momentum. It's facing the reality that not everyone will come on this journey. In my own um, church in St. George's, as a consequence of some of the general synod decisions, which as a church uh, we supported, um, very much so, but not everybody in our church. And so some people felt that wasn't for them, and so they left. And there's a real sense of loss to the community that flowed from that. Not everyone will come on that journey. There's a cost of clarity because it forces us to be much more accountable to each other and to our father and mother. But let me make a couple of positive points about change. When I was working at World Vision, uh, we faced major change. Uh, and it was really tough because we realized that if we did this change badly, it would have a direct impact on, on children on the other side of the world who had absolutely no ability to actually do anything about it. 
what actually happened is that through leading change and by confronting our sacred cows, by facing the brutal facts, by actually recognizing that we had to go on this journey, even though we're feeling somewhat fearful of it, we rediscovered our mission. And it was amazing. We rediscovered our mission that actually what we we're about, we're a faith-based organization and that we were called to uh, give children around the world life and life in all its fullness. And actually from that, we reclaimed a sense of who we were our identity, and also a deep and profound trust in the Lord, that actually this wasn't our organization, it was the Lord's. And as part of that, we saw something else happen, which is that uh, it unleashed incredible potential in a whole lot of people. Now, these were people who were often at the margins, in my case, of World Vision and prior to that at Hawke's Bay. So within the organization, but not in the center of the organization, often quite disenfranchised from the old, but suddenly untap this incredible potential when we move towards the new. And so one of the joys of, of change leadership is actually seeing new leaders emerging. But as I say, this is not for the faint-hearted because one of the key things you're gonna to have to confront is this next slide. The next slide is what we call the circle of niceness. Um, and if there is a pandemic within the Anglican church, and I might add probably most, major denominations in New Zealand, it's probably the circle of niceness. It's often reflected as a, a passive aggressiveness. So yes to your face, but uh, when you turn away, uh, a shake of the head. How do we diagnose the circle of niceness? Well, let's take a vestry, it's a, a theoretical um, proposition rather than an actual one. But here's a evidence of a vestry that will be in trouble. It's when vestry people stop listening. It's when commitments to each other and to the wider church community start being broken. It's when the group starts to practice what's called groupthink. In other words, it's more important that we stick together than confront the issues that we need to face. So in other words, group um, unity is more important than confronting the issues. Uh, you know a vestry is in trouble, or for that matter, a diocese or a whatever we're talking about, is where the conversation shifts from a focus on content, a focus on the mission, to a debate about process, and who was involved, and who wasn't involved, and why wasn't I involved, and this is the wrong process, and so on. What's going on there, in other words, is that people are diverting from the real issue and putting up smoke screens. You know there's trouble when decision-making is slowing down, and that people are becoming increasingly inflexible in response to the change. Two tests that I've seen, including in one of my own organizations, is that I knew we had trouble when um, there was simply poor manners. People spoke poorly. They spoke over the top of each other. They were disrespectful. And lastly, a lack of self-control, when you're seeing people getting visibly angry and clearly losing any sense of emotional rhythm in their life. This is the circle of niceness. It's a huge challenge if it's part of the change agenda you're having to tackle. But believe me, uh, it is has the impact of a pandemic and it takes many people out with it. Folks, you'll be relieved to know I'm getting towards the, well, three quarter point of the slides. So uh, let's carry on. And um, I want to introduce you to this chap. Bit of light relief, really. His name is uh, Thomas Clarkson. And for those of you who, um, <laughs> uh, like me, um, enjoy history, Thomas Clarkson is in many ways the uh, unsung hero of the anti-slavery movement of the early 19th century. Uh, we all associate and revere uh, William um, Wilberforce, and so we should. But behind William Wilberforce was Thomas Clarkson. Thomas Clarkson was a very bright young man. He went to University at Cambridge. He wrote an essay on, um, is it ever lawful to detain somebody? As he was riding home on his horse, because remember this is pre-cars, um, God speaks to him in a very real way, and he says to him, if this is so, Thomas, what are you going to do about it? So uh, rather than going into the church, he decided to become a campaigner, and he spent the rest of his life campaigning uh, against slavery. He was, in fact, the one who introduced William Wilberforce. William Wilberforce at that stage was wanting to um, spend his time in a life of contemplation and prayer. And Clarkson, um, along with John Newton, were two of the most instrumental people in convincing William Wilberforce that his core, that his mission, was actually to lead the uh, anti-slavery campaign. Clarkson traveled over 10,000 miles on horseback throughout the UK, night after night, speaking in church halls, speaking all over the place. He would collect exhibits from um, slave ships to show people the shackles and so on. Uh, he was tireless. It cost him his health. He was uh, almost assassinated on two occasions. He had a major period of mental illness and actually disappeared from the campaign for a number of years. Now, he is not the hero of the campaign. 
Uh, the hero of the campaign undoubtedly is William Wilberforce. But without Clarkson, there would be no Wilberforce. Why do I mention that? It's because most of us as leaders of change will be the Clarksons of this world. Very, very few of us are called to be the William Wilberforces of this world. And yet without the Clarksons, there'll be no Wilberforce. So for each one of us, as we contemplate change, and contemplate leading change, this is never about us. It was never about Clarkson. He understood that. It's about the mission. Now then, we have arrived, the Mazda 323, with um, two car sick toddlers uh, who even themselves now are so sick to death with bananas and pajamas. Uh, they have had countless milkshakes, bought them up uh, on the road as we've gone along. We've stopped at every possible playground that you could. We've finally arrived. We've finally pitched the tent. And for the next two weeks, we're on holiday. Here's the thing. You've made the change happen. All you want to do is have a cup of tea and a lie down. Actually, this is the point that you don't relax. This is, in some respects, the most dangerous time of change. Because if there are any terrorists out there, uh, this is the time when they will show their head. And those that do not like the change will most come into play. So you cannot afford to relax even for a minute. Very important that you capture the learnings, both for yourself personally, uh, in terms of leading change, but also collectively, in terms of what will we do differently? What will we do the same? And critically, where was the Lord in this conversation? Where were those things that just happened where actually we couldn't explain it up but for the Lord? Celebrate with those um, who came on the journey is that a lot of people have put a lot of energy into this and they deserve to celebrate. And as I said earlier on, honor those who stayed behind. This is the time to enable people to lead well. So to our next slide, I want to talk about leading through change. And I'll let you pause here because for some of you, you may well <laughs> want to take a toilet break or um, get a cup of tea or something like that, um, you go and do that, I'll carry on talking, because then what we can do is, is have a bit of a discussion at the end. But these um, seven bubbles on the slide are my personal reflections on leading um, a major piece of change at Hawke's Bay. Without going into the detail, we faced a real crisis when I was the CEO at Hawke's Bay. Um, the first three years were remarkably good sailing, it was absolutely splendid time. Uh, the last three and a half years were particularly challenging because of a dispute that manifested itself as a dispute between governance and management. But actually, it was much more complex than that. Without going into the detail of that, I learned a lot about how do I lead myself, lighten up um, and, uh, uh, and lighten the load, but also about how you lead organisations through major change. And I think it applies whether you're leading a large district health board or, for that matter, a small community group. So here are my kind of conclusions when I reflected back on the change that I led and the bits that I led well and the bits I didn't lead well. There's a really important role for the change leader um, to be uh, constant. It's that lovely old English word of constancy. In other words, that the person who turns up on Tuesday is just the same person who turned up on Monday and will be the same person that turns up on Wednesday. doesn't mean that you're a cheerful optimist but actually it does mean that the change team are not having to manage your emotional climate. I've worked for leaders who went through the full emotional gambit as they were leading change. It's incredibly destructive on the team because what happens is you're managing the emotion of the leader rather than the emotion of the organization. Secondly, very important in managing change to tell stories. So I'll, I'll um, give you an example of this because it was very powerful in our own case. Um, in the middle of this crisis at Hawke's Bay, we had a wonderful hospital and wonderful staff, but one of our key managers ran the emergency department in ICU. She was also a very keen cyclist. And uh, it was a Sunday morning, I was out running and, and she passed me on her bike, uh, absolutely flying along. This was about sort of seven o'clock in the morning. We waved, she carried on cycling. I got back from my run and about an hour later, I got a phone call from the hospital to say that could I come in because there'd been a terrible accident and this particular person had been hit by a car while she was biking. So I realized it must have happened sometime after I'd seen her. Now she was a very much loved person. And I rushed into the hospital to see her and she came in and she was in a very bad way. Now she'd been on duty the night before. So in fact, many of the people that were looking after her had been on duty with her. She got absolute superb care as she came through the emergency department and went through to the ICU. Ultimately she survived, which was a miracle in itself, but um, that was really thanks to the incredible care that she got. Now the point was this, 
that about half an hour after she arrived, a young boy came into the same emergency department. He had um, broken his leg in a car crash. And it came really clear to us very early on that actually he was the boy that had run over our beloved staff member. And what had happened, he'd had a bit to drink. He'd been driving home that morning and uh, he suddenly realized that his shoelaces were undone. So he leant down to do up his shoelaces while he's driving. And he drove straight over the top of our staff member. I mean, you can understand the sense of anger and frustration and injustice towards this young man. But here's the point of the story. The extraordinary point of the story, I saw him come in, realized straight away what happened. And his accident was relatively trivial compared to the person who he'd hit. But he received the same quality of care, the same compassion, the same respect. No comment was made to him about what had happened, even though he's been cared for by the very same people that were caring for the staff member. Why, why do I tell you that story? Because I told that story to our hospital right in the midst of the crisis. And I was saying to them, look, this is our values. The stuff that's going on out there in the governance world, that's not who we are. This is who we are. Who we are is that we extend care and love and compassion to people irrespective of the circumstances of how they find themselves in our care. Really important when you're leading change to tell the stories. Remember when. What you're doing there is you're reminding people of the vision, the values, and the mission of the organization. The next point, the sanctity of the mundane. Really important here, which is that when I was going through one major piece of change, this particular crisis, one of the things I realized was that um, I wanted to hide in my office. It's a very natural instinct. I just did not want to be seen. I realized it was really important just to go through the everyday routines that I normally follow. That's called constancy. In other words, going to the staff cafeteria, as I always did, doing the ward rounds, as I always did, being seen, even though my instinct was to go and hide. So suddenly the mundane takes on quite a, a hallowed, quite a a holy aspect to it. Um, care of self, we've already talked about this in terms of lightening up the load and uh, lightening up. But it does lead to another point, which is about um, moral courage. As a young man, I uh, thought the courage was all about uh, essentially uh, how brave I was physically. And I probably, to be honest, sat somewhere in the middle. I wasn't the bravest, but I certainly wasn't the least brave. What I learned in uh, leading change is the power of moral courage. And I had a wonderful commissioner who came in who had a question he asked me consistently, which is, Chris, what is the right thing to do? And that's a moral question. And it requires often real courage to answer and particularly to make that answer happen. But there is such a thing as doing the right thing. And of course, as Christians, we understand the significance of that, that our accountability is a much deeper accountability than many other people experience. So I learned the power of doing the right thing, even when it was at my cost, that there's an enormous sense of empowerment that comes from doing that. And then lastly, in terms of the, um, uh, the, the sort of seven things, I would pick up on, um, in fact, here I'm pausing because I can't even read my own words. <laughs> Uh, some of you can. Let me just move that thing out of the way. Finding leaders in unexpected places. That was what I was looking for. Um, it is that in leading change, look for the um, real leaders in your organization. Hopefully, some of them are sitting in the established leadership roles. I learned that one of those powerful uh, leaders in my organization was a woman called Mary. She was on the checkout at the hospital cafeteria. So every day she spoke to many patients, to certainly all their family members as well as a large percentage of the medical, nursing, uh, therapist and management staff. So she had an extraordinary um, knowledge of what was going on in the, in the hospital. And she would actually deliberately seek to influence people for the positive. Uh, and I learned very quickly that actually she was probably one of my most effective leaders in the organization. Ironically, she was also among the least paid, which of course was a, a source of some real embarrassment on my part. But look for leaders in your organization and look for them particularly at the boundaries. So, what are the demands that we placed on you as change leaders? You'll need boldness, you'll need courage. I think it starts with lament in the sense of acknowledging what you're saying goodbye to and what that means for people, but also lament in the sense of what happens if we don't do this? But if there isn't that sense of lament as part of your change journey, I suspect you're being somewhat trivial and in that sense you aren't bringing that genuine sense of empathy to change that's needed. You'll need to slay some temptations which will um, present themselves to you. This has certainly been my experience. 
I like to be liked. I like to be well regarded. I like to be popular. I like to be successful. One of the things that I've learned painfully, and when change hasn't gone well, I've realized it's because I didn't slay this particular dragon, is when niceness dominates over doing the right thing. That in change, there'll be a period of ascesis, which is a word which is rich in meaning, but essentially a period of confinement where you are all alone. That inevitably you will have to confront the circle of niceness, the passive aggressiveness, which is usually just below the surface uh, in, in most organizations. Accepting sadly that not everyone will make it. Some people were made for the old, made for the current world, but actually won't translate well into the new world. That's really, really hard. Understanding that every leader, yourself included, myself included certainly, casts a shadow. What's my shadow? My shadow is that at times I overvalue loyalty. At times in a desire to be nice, I blink uh, and dodge taking the hard decisions. There are many other shadows, but fortunately time uh, allows me only to name a two. And have around you a very small circle of trust. When you're leading major change, this is not a time to crowdsource it too, too widely. You need a small group of people that you're working with. Now, for those of you looking at your clock, we're just about there. I want to touch on two other slides. The ethics of change. Change is going to mess with people's heads. Change is going to mean that you are challenging things that people hold dear. Change is going to mean that people are going to have to do things in different ways to how they did it. So do that respectfully. And there is an ethic behind change. First of all, honor the present. Never, ever, ever criticize the present to justify the need for change. I see this rule broken time after time after time and time again. And then you wonder why don't we carry people's hearts and minds? We don't carry people's hearts and minds because we've just criticized them and just criticized them for things that were once good and once holy and once very worth celebrating. So never ever criticize the current or the past and use that as a justification for the need for change. So honor the present. Doesn't mean that we don't talk about the importance of change, but we do it in an honoring way. And it flows that uh, recognize that all people have unique value in God's eyes, that you should never therefore personalize change. Um, I am sure many of you have seen this and maybe yourself have, 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 have reflected this, is where a marriage breaks down, suddenly the, the, the partner goes from being Mary or Karen or John or Fred and becomes the partner or the former wife or the ex. What happens is we need to depersonalize just to get through the pain. We must never, ever, ever do that when it comes to managing change. We must recognize that everybody, irrespective of where they sit in the cycle of change, whether they're a romantic, wanting to go back to the past, whether they're a pragmatist, whether they're an idealist or somewhere in between, is that every person is unique and made in the image of God. Never put people through change you would not put yourself through. Don't oversell it. Um, <laughs> Man, have I seen this happen. It's a bit like trying to sell a house, isn't it? You oversell the virtues of this beautiful house, which in fact is quite ordinary. Never oversell change. At best, it's a more promising land rather than the promised land. You see, going back to that story of Joshua, he led two million people across the river. That was an extraordinary achievement, I have to say. They built an altar and celebrated God's faithfulness. He still had 38 battles to fight before he actually got to secure the promised land. So at best, what we're talking about is a more promising land than perhaps the one we currently um, are alert to. Be alert to the power you have and use it wisely. My experience is that most people have more power than they actually appreciate. And the power takes a number of forms. It's reputation, it's moral power, uh, hopefully not physical power, but uh, reputational power and so on. So you have a lot more power than you realize. And at the end of the day, you've been called to be courageous rather than nice. Folks, on that note, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to a lovely quote. Um, it's from uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, many of you will have heard it, but it's really an ode to any of us who have found that we've got a bummer of a birthmark on our chest and we're the ones who are supposed to be leading change. So for all of you who are looking at your chest and thinking, yep, I think I'm wearing a birthmark, uh, this is for you. It's not the critic in the stands who counts. It's not those who point out where strong people stumbled or where the doer of the deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to those who are actually in the arena. 
whose faces are marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strive valiantly, who err and come up short again and again, who know great enthusiasms, who at best know the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if they fall, at least fall while daring greatly, so that their place will never be with those cold and timid souls who know, know neither victory nor defeat. So for those of you um, marred by dust, sweat and blood in the arena, who strive valiantly, who err and come up short again and again, who know great enthusiasms, who sometimes know high achievement, but at worst feel like there's just a whole lot more mud on your chest. Uh, that is what we're called to do. On that note, I'm going to hand back to Stephen. Kia ora, Chris. Um, much appreciated. An extraordinary amount of uh, information has just come through to us. And I know those uh, notes that we'll make available online will be mined and mined over the coming months. Uh, I think this is a great opportunity for those of you who have questions to put them to Chris so that he can grapple with them now. We've got a couple that have come through on the Q&A section already. So I'll invite Chris to respond to those in the first instance. And then if you've got anything else uh, that you want to put either of Q&A or uh, to raise a hand, then I'll try and keep an eye out for that. But in the first instance, Chris, can you see those Q&As? I can see uh, the two ones from Wendy. Perfect. Hey, excellent. Hello, Wendy. Uh, <laughs> Oh my, yeah, great question. So for those of you who perhaps can't, can't see the, the question, let me just summarize it for you, which is that uh, Wendy's making the point that when leading change, uh, she's seen some leaders sacrifice because the vestry or other leaders don't want to deal with poor behavior of power players and the behavior is such that they don't want to, to upset. So what happens is that because they've been here for so long or they gave, I can't see the rest of the answer actually, um, but I think I've got the gist of the question. Um, how do we deal with that? And how do we deal with that where we're on the receiving end of it? Um, a couple of thoughts. Um, it is critical that in approaching change, whether you're in a governance role, such as a vestry, or whether you're in a management role, um, that you agree that you will never see any light um, of day between the two of you. Uh, and it's really important that conversations had up front. And it's really important, I, I've had to do this in a couple of contexts, to actually talk about the behaviours that are acceptable and are not acceptable. And I think the failure to have that courageous conversation up front often leads to problems when things start to go south. And I can think of one context that I was in where I was basically hung out to dry, so I understand this question. Because um, the person concerned said to me, Chris, you don't understand, I grew up in this community and I'll die in this community. People like you come and go. Uh, and basically what the person was saying to me is, I'll sacrifice you for the sake of my relationships. That's really tough. Um, and that's, I think, can only be addressed through a conversation up front. Change will never work if trust breaks down. When trust breaks down, it's all over. Uh, and so working to build that trust from the start is really important. When the question itself I mean, deserves a lot of thoughts i've only really touched on an aspect of it but i do understand it and actually what i might do is i'll reflect on that a bit more and maybe flip, flip you something after this um how can we undertake self-preservation and call out poor behavior um yes this is where change is risky and this is where you can suddenly find that actually your birthmark is attracting a lot of attention Again, I think it goes back to packing the car, going on the journey. And as part, part of packing the car, even before the change starts, it's actually agreeing rules of engagement, actually how we'll treat each other, in particular, how we'll treat each other when we disagree. I've had it happen to me and I've seen it happen to others where they're hung out to dry in a public setting and they never saw it coming. And it's the most lonely and awful place to be. So actually having those conversations about how are we gonna to learn to agree or disagree with each other and how will we deal with that without actually humiliating the other. Ross, you've got a question in establishing the need for change, we should try to reach consensus. If this is not possible, we sometimes revert to democracy uh, and is always having a vote appropriate and what are the risks? Oh yes. Well, it's really interesting in scripture that 
uh, there's only in the New Testament one, as I know, as I can recall, uh, one recorded example of a democratic vote. And that was, if you recall, was after uh, the disciples had to find somebody to replace Judas. And uh, they drew lots and they voted and they appointed somebody and they never heard of again, actually. I don't think they figured all in the rest of the New Testament. So as a model of decision-making, um, it doesn't have that much of a precedent. Um, there is obviously a place for the popular vote, but I actually think it's a limited place. And I do think that sometimes we hide behind the popular vote because we're afraid to lead ourselves. And invariably the popular vote will typically lead to lowest common denominator stuff. So I am very cautious about using um, popular vote processes for decisions. And I think it goes back to, in particular, if we think about a vestry, what is the role of a vestry and what is it tasked with doing? And it should actually step up and provide that leadership. Uh, and that votes, if they happen, should be very limited. Now, I've got three Q&As there. Um, there might be others or people might want to actually respond. Fantastic. Chris, um, Andrew Evans here from All Saints Anglican Matamata. Um, I, I, I've just been contemplating change with the church. Um, and one of, the, one of the things I've been thinking about is that there is to some degree, because our, our demographic is what it is, uh, there, there is a degree to which you could ostensibly leave people in Egypt mm -hmm. and start work across the Jordan River. Um, you know, and that's not really, I mean, it's change management long term because those who are in Egypt, ultimately you'll bury them. Um, and you've sort of got a, a, a time, time frame in which, you know, which you can get the work established in the new land and, and then be sort of viable, I guess. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what my question is there. I mean, it's just something I've been thinking about is, you know, I had an AGM on, on Sunday and just listened to some of the questions that came out and thought, well, you know, the vast majority of the folk here are not moving. Um, so there's no potential really for change management that will take people on or that group of people on the journey. Um, and so maybe I have to almost tent ministry kind of stuff um, to, to, to manage long-term change. Um, yeah, maybe that's comment and not question. I'm not sure. Maybe you can. It's a fantastic, um, it's a fantastic comment. Uh, and, and just to add to that, I'll give you an example of one. Funny, I was talking about it last night. Um, we, for many years, lived in Wellington and went to All Saints in Ataitai. All Saints in Ataitai was, uh, at the time, quite a, quite a large church, but it had a very um, distributed population, some very elderly people and some uh, young people. We were running the youth group and getting that classic tension between trying to encourage young people to come to church and they were saying to us, but look, it doesn't do anything for us. There's a choir, there's an organ, it doesn't work for us, we want guitars, we want drums. You, you know that many of you <laughs> witnessed those experiences. Uh, I saw a remarkable piece of change management, which actually goes, I think, to what you're talking about, where recognising that we couldn't take everybody on the journey, the vicar, a remarkable chap called Ian Vaughan, um, said, okay, what we're going to do is we'll set up this little group within the church, and that can become the, the, the generator of new ideas. And, and he, he put his stamp on that. What he did, and it, it happened in a point of crisis, is that um, we were having an evening service, sung even song. And uh, Ian invited a guitarist to play. The guitarist played, and this deeply offended the choir, who still were there. But this was the first time that I've ever heard a guitar played in the even song. So um, one, of the, one of the choir basically then went on strike and said, you know, we're out of here. We're not appreciated. We're not loved. And this is the beginning of the end. And uh, Ian, to his credit, called their bluff. And he said, all right. Thank you very much. <laughs> You've served the church very faithfully. Um, I respect your decision. I'm certainly not going to try and trivialize it. Um, I just want to thank you for what you've done. And he handed us the evening service. And out of that grew about a 20-year evening service, which was remarkably successful. An incredible number of people came to faith. Now, the wisdom of what he ended is that it was a courageous call that he made. And in some respects, to be honest, he called the bluff of the choir, who were exerting quite a lot of... of of uh, it was a power play it certainly wasn't passive aggressive it was pretty aggressive full stop so he gave us the backing he created the space and then out of that young people came forward and we created the service which was remarkably successful and it coexisted within 
you know, comparatively traditional church. So maybe that's an example of, rather than trying to take everyone across the river, is that you, within the structure, within the organisation or movement, uh, uh, create change. Now, Rosie, you've asked a really good question about what are some examples of change in the church? Um, I can just list some that, that I'm familiar with and, and uh, others much more closer to the action in, in Taranaki and Waikato can, can talk to it. But when I think about um, your diocese, one of the things I think about is very practical stuff, is that you're seeing in parts of Hamilton exponential growth as people are moving out of Auckland to Hamilton. Uh, and there's no church presence. And then in older parts of Hamilton, you've got large numbers of, you know, of congregations quite close to each other. So that's a change conversation about how do we move to um, meet the needs of these vast new areas that are growing in Hamilton. Because at the end of the day, we're a mission. You know, we believe in the mission of God to change this world. So that would be an example. Another kind of example of change would actually be in terms of quite deliberately um, bringing younger leaders through into positions of responsibility within a church and investing in them, even knowing that they maybe lack the experience uh, and that there needs to be some coaching uh, to enable them to do that. So there's just a couple of, of, of examples. Then there are obviously practical ones around building projects, around decisions to close communities, decisions to open new communities. Chris, I've just been reflecting on Ross Hogg's question and the uh, Q&A section as well and thinking on it in terms of Friedman's book I know we talked about it earlier today yeah. Yeah, of Nerve. and there's something about that word consensus which is a real trigger for him I think the phrase might be consensus seeds power to terrorists do you have uh, do you have any thoughts about that Brian? yeah um I do, and uh, these thoughts may not be very holy, but for those of you who, who are interested in reading in the whole subject of leadership, um, Friedman's book, it's called A Failure of Nerve, is a remarkable book. Um, it was assembled uh, after he died, but he was a major thinker in terms of actually family theory and organizational theory, but he speaks um, deeply into these topics. Um, consensus uh, has its place, but it goes back to the point about what is your... Are you trying to tell? Are you trying to sell? Are you trying to consult? Are you trying to co-create? It's it. You need to work out the framework first before you you leap to consensus. It is a miracle if you can achieve consensus, um, and uh, it sometimes happens. But to expect a hundred percent consensus probably means the change isn't particularly big. So uh, I personally am not a great fan of consensus because I think it's a cop out on the part of leaders. And what it does do is it tends to empower people who have other agendas. Now. That puts a huge amount of pressure on you as the change leader that you, you're on the side of the angels. Uh, and that actually means, actually in truth, that we need to be in deep relationship with Christ to actually know that what we're doing is the right thing to do. Because if it's the right thing to do, we'll, we'll do it irrespective of whether we have a consensus or not. Now, that doesn't mean you don't bully, that you're going to bully or things like that. But what it does mean is you're not being led by the populist vote. Uh, had Jacinda Ardern led a consensus model on COVID-19, I doubt we would be where we are today. Um, Joel's question, look, uh, do you think we always need to be in a state of change? At the moment, yes, I do. Um, I wish it wasn't that way, but I think the speed of change has sped up exponentially. Uh, and particularly if I think about the church, I think we are, we are confronting major change. Uh, what we're seeing is that among young people, the next generation, um, they are, to put it frankly, not going to church. They are very spiritual, very interested in having spiritual conversations, but they're not looking typically to the institutional church for those kind of answers. So if we want to be a generational church, and that goes back to the opening prayer and uh, the opening reading from Corinthians, then I'm afraid we do have to change. And it's not just the church. Change is happening around us at such an exponential speed, but it is exhausting. I totally get that. And I, I so wish it wasn't quite as, as exhausting as is. In the last three months, uh, we have seen the impact of COVID. One comment I'd make on that is in terms of COVID is that um, at best, we're at the end of the beginning. The implications of this will be profound and beyond anything we have imagined. And that's all in front of us. To uh, Jaquil's question, um, uh, yeah, Anglican processes and voting. Yeah, look, I, 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 I think you've put your finger on a really big issue. Um, I don't have an answer to it, but I do think there is a disconnect between 
popular vote and leading change, particularly in unsettled times. Um, I, I don't have an answer to it, but I think you've made a really powerful point. And then to Brendan's question, that as a vicar or a priest, you're actually ministering to both those who want change and those who don't want change. Oh, yes. Do I understand what you're talking about? Because I used to grapple with that in um, when I was at World Vision and also actually when I was at Hawke's Bay. Um, and it goes back to recognizing that you're a pastor and that everybody is made in the image of God uh, and that we have to accept the fact that not everyone is going to go with us on the journey. That doesn't mean that we abandon them, but we accept that we minister to them uh, where they are. I, I know I'm sounding a bit trite there. I don't mean to, because I understand really well what you're saying. But um, that, that is the reality. Um, but at the end of the day, that can't paralyze us from doing the right thing. Thank you so much, Chris, for the brilliant contribution that you've made to this really important topic. Thanks to everyone who has contributed questions on the Q&A section or via the chat. Uh, it's clear that this has triggered a number of um, discussions and I know that there'll be some really healthy thinking in all our groups around the diocese as well. Uh, Chris, in that resource that you've gifted to us so generously, there are a whole sequence of slides that I know that you've left for us to do, dig into later. Um, and there are some templates and some guides and some strategies that will be really helpful for our leadership teams to work with as they try and work towards what change and what the uh, consequences of change might be. Your humour and your stories, I mean, the, the image of the toddlers in the back seat of the car for the 12 hour drive and arriving full of milkshakes and car sick is too close to home uh, <laughs> for comfort, to be honest. And uh, I really am grateful for the work that you have done in the profit and not-for-profit sectors uh, in New Zealand and overseas. It's so important for us to have Christian role models <laughs> and leaders out in the environment that we can aspire to. So thank you for the sacrifices that you have made in your roles and thank you for your willingness to make this really significant contribution to our diocese and to this, to our Papa Foundations series. Bless you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, just a Absolute pleasure. Real pleasure, folks, and thank you for being so attentive. Uh, I'm just going to remove the spotlight and switch it over to Bishop Philip. And Bishop, I'll invite you to close with prayers and any other reflections that you might have at this time. Thanks very much, Stephen. And uh, Chris, again, thanks so much. Uh, I think the first time, Chris, you and I met was when you um, led a session uh, for the House of Bishops, actually here in Hamilton, interestingly. Um, and that's quite a few years ago now. Um, you've worked with our Tikana Pākehā Ministry uh, Council uh, over a, over a couple of years now, helping us to think about uh, about our direction and our priorities and, and change. Uh, you've worked with our bishop staff here for a couple of days towards the end of last year, and next week we're working you hard again uh, on Wednesday with the bishop staff and with the trust board and with the standing committee. Uh, and you're also going to help the Bishops Action Foundation. So. As I said at the beginning, you really are a friend uh, to this diocese, and it, it's it's because you do understand us from the inside out, and you you uh, uh, you're a, um, an Anglican who can critique from the inside because you uh, have such broad experience. So, thanks so much. I was just reflecting on that question uh, about uh, from uh, Jekyllie and from uh, Tikiwiri Pupu about you know, voting and and consensus and leadership and all of those things. And I was, I was just reflecting on our General Synod on, on Saturday, which passed some momentous uh, legislation, legislation which um, really does um, address uh, some of the most challenging aspects of any community's life, which is around how we, how we live to the standards that the gospel calls us into in a way that is deeply respectful um, of every human being and where uh, any form of abuse is, is uh, recognised as destructive and, and counterproductive to our very identity. And thinking about that and thinking about the three years uh, of work that went into that, in a sense when it came to the voting that felt like an amen 
rather than uh, uh, you know, a kind of way of demonstrating consensus. Um, the consensus that this was the right thing to be doing and that although we might debate some of the detail, uh, the, the direction was right, the emphasis was right, the priorities were right, had been built up over a long period of consultation and working together. And it did feel like an amen rather than a vote. And maybe that's, uh, that's where, where it, uh, the voting operates at its best when it's, um, where it, when it's a reflection of the work rather than uh, a way of um, determining power, which it can often be. Uh, just part of, of night prayer as we um, gather ourselves and, and offer ourselves and all that we've talked about to God. Um, Stephen will put up a prayer in, in a few minute, uh, moments when we get there, uh, which I invite you to join with me in saying uh, in, your, in your local context. But from night prayer, uh, into your hands, O God, I commend my spirit. For you have redeemed me, O God, of truth and love. Keep me, O God, as the apple of an eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings. And Psalm 134. We, your servants, bless you, O God, as we stand by night in your house. We lift up our hands towards the holy place and give you thanks and praise. Bless us from all places where you dwell, O God, creator of the heavens and of the earth. And the reading uh, from night prayer for Tuesday night. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Do good. And lend expecting nothing in return. For God is kind to the ungrateful and to the selfish. Be merciful as your Father is merciful. Judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. For the measure you give will be the measure you receive. So Stephen, if you'd like to just share that slide and the prayer known as the Oscar Romero prayer, uh, we pray this together. It helps now and then to step back and take a long view. The kingdom is not only beyond our efforts, it's even beyond our vision. We accomplish in our lifetime only a tiny fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we do is complete which is a way of saying that the kingdom always lies beyond us. No statement says all that could be said. No prayer fully expresses our faith. No confession brings perfection. No pastoral visit brings wholeness. No program accomplishes the church's mission. No set of goals and objectives includes everything. This is what we're about. We plant the seeds that one day will grow. We water seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that produces far beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything, and there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. This enables us to do something and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future, not our own. God, the creator who loved us first and gave this world to be our home, to God, the redeemer, who loves us and by dying and rising pioneered the way of freedom, to God the Sanctifier, who spreads the divine love in our hearts, be praise and glory for time and for eternity. The divine spirit dwells in us. Thanks be to God. God bless your night and your rest.
and thank you so much for joining us. Look forward very much indeed to next Tuesday night when uh, Dean Wendy Scott will uh, lead our session.